The Fantasy Animation Podcast is a completely independent production. It is made by experts in the field. Chris is a lecturer in liberal arts and visual cultures education at King's College London and author of The Computer Animated Film, available in all good bookshops. And I, Alex that is, am a senior lecturer in film and media studies at the University of Portsmouth and author of Encountering the Impossible, the fantastic in Hollywood fantasy cinema, available in even better bookshops. We do this podcast to provide audiences with an informative and hopefully entertaining guide through the ways in which you can not only enjoy fantasy and animation, but study it, examine it, explore it, and of course, make it and have a career in it. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi listeners and welcome to the latest episode of the Fantasy Animation Podcast with me, Chris Holiday, And me, Alex Sargent. If we sound a little different, it's because we are recording this live. This is the, the, uh, one of several we are recording at the, the BAFTS 2024 um, Academic Conference. So we've managed to um, grab, metaphorically, a few academics to come and talk with us about various films that we thought would be really interesting. So if for this episode and a few others, I guess, in the way that we release them, they sound like we're not in our usual... Uh, space. That's the reason why. Yeah, we're in a, we're in an in a empty seminar room uh, on the University of Sussex campus. Uh, thanks to the BAS for organising it and uh, allowing us to do all these here. It's nice to be able to uh, meet up with lots of different academics in this one space. Yes, uh, so we are, for this episode, we are doing, in all true, um, I was going to say, in the spirit of doing a franchise properly, we're doing the last <laughs> and the final uh, instalment of the Indiana Jones franchise, so Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. It won't surprise anybody, Alex included, to know that I haven't really seen these films, and I and I have now seen them, but I also saw them in the wrong order. I was saying to our special guest, um, kind of before we started, that I my first uh, go at, at Indiana Jones was Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which I saw at cinemas and then have just watched them in a very uh, disorderly fashion I have um, as of a couple of days ago now seen Dial of Destiny so I'm really interested of course um, to talk about digital de-aging I guess uh, the, the kind of reflexivity with, with time um, I guess the fact this is, as I mentioned at the start, a, a sort of franchise film. So, yeah, I think... And, and also, I think there's something to, to say about this film as maybe a reflection on the issue of de-aging and maybe that split between sound and, and an image and the, the voice. But, um, yeah, I, I think so. That's, that's where I'm coming from. Alex? Well, I'm glad that we have a guest who will introduce in a second to help us through this because I'm also not necessarily the, your classic indie fan. Interesting. I'll put you seen, down as one. Yeah. yeah, I have seen them all and I saw them all as a kid, but I never was sort of that into them. My favourite was always... Temple of Doom, which is the kind of the weird one. Um, uh, middle maybe, one? The middle, middle, yeah, well, the, middle, the middle one, of the three. The, the middle one, the horrific one, the racist one. Uh, uh, add whichever synonym you, you would like. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> uh, but I always, what was always fascinating about that movie was its kind of fantastical elements. So we can talk about um, the franchise that we've sort of precursed this moment before we started recording. But, you know, as, as historical drama versus as fantastical drama, as religious epic and the way it kind of is riffing on all, all those things. So, yeah, no, excited to talk about Dial of Destiny. Great stuff. Uh, we are delighted um, to be joined by, I think, a, a scholar who we've mentioned certainly on this podcast many times before, uh, Sarah Thomas, who is Senior Lecturer in Communication and Media at the University of Liverpool, um, specialising in research on the Hollywood film industry, stardom and immersive media. Her publications include the forthcoming Stars and Franchises, so we can definitely... Um, kind of use that, I think, as a, as a starting point, as well as books on James Mason for the BFI Film Stars series, so Bloomsbury 2018, uh, and an article that I've certainly cited um, on more than one occasion, the star in VR from Celebrity Studies from 2019. So, Sarah, thank you ever so much for, for joining us on the pod. Thanks for having me here. I'm really looking forward to talking about Indiana Jones because I am a big fan Good. of Indiana Jones. Well, let's start there. Let, let's, let's start there. So is this... You're, you're, you're a fan of the franchise... Um, 
where, how does this yeah. fit in with your kind well, of research into stardom this, franchises technology? This, but uh, it, it's really interesting to talk about Dial of Destiny specifically, although I'm sure we will talk about all of them because you can't shut me up about <laughs> the rest of them as well and, and kind of how they all fit together. Um, th there's kind of three modes, I think, in terms of how uh, Indiana Jones as a whole and Dial of Destiny kind of fits into my work. The first is um, I, I'm, I'm really interested in the intersection between uh, the franchise property, particularly the film franchise series, and how major stardom fits into that. Uh, is it a, a, a moment of tension that exists between a kind of a, a character or a story verse IP, and how does you know uh, leading kind of star figures like Harrison Ford fit into that, and, and how do they work together? So I've, I've um, completed um, a, a chapter actually mapping. The, uh, the kind of the history of Harrison Ford in Indiana Jones as, as an idea of how, how the shifting star power has affected the franchise series as a whole from 1981 right to the end. And that's going to be in a forthcoming book on the Indiana Jones um, franchise with Manchester University Press, edited by Luella Chapman. Um, so that's it. That start, and that started me then thinking about how stars and franchises work together which has led to an edited collection that we're working on at the moment and other work that I've done on Keanu Reeves and John Wick. The second mode is my um, existing work at the moment. What I'm really interested in is the, the digital replication of celebrity and stardom. So Dial of Destiny, particularly, I was kind of thrilled when all the early kind of discourse came out about the, the de-aged Harrison Ford and the kind of the spectacle of what that would be. So uh, it, it really kind of fits in with what I'm kind of interested in, in how digital technologies are helping us kind of engage differently with star figures from that. Yeah. Thirdly, and this yeah. is not research-based at all, I am just a big fan of the films. Um, one of the first meetings I kind of had with my, uh, my, my now husband, we talked about Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark at length as a perfect film. I mentioned it in my wedding speech, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, so good. I will kind of, you know, and I, I am a really, um, they were an important uh, series of films for, for me growing up in the 80s and 90s. Harrison Ford is an important figure kind of tracing through that. So I'm really happy to kind of talk about the big picture too. Cool. Should we, should we start there as a means of kind of warming us all up before we get into issues of sort of star cap power and image discourse and all this sort of stuff? Let's start with, you know, how successful we think the film is as, mm. a, as a, either a closer or yep. an epilogue or whatever it is yeah. of the franchise. What did you make of it? What did yeah, you think absolutely. of it? Where does so, it fit? So I, I saw this in the cinema and I don't get to go to the cinema very often. And the, the, two, <laughs> the two big films that I have got to the cinema most recently are, you know, showing my kind of age are the last Star Wars films and uh, Dial of Destiny. So it was important to me to kind of see it, I think, in that context, in an IMAX context. Um, and I have to say, given what the critical reception has been around it and the kind of commercial, it's just come out this week, it's been a commercial flop, basically. It's lost huge amounts of money. Um, it was an empty cinema right. uh, around it. So, that, you know, there is that sense of who is, who is this for and kind sure. of around it. However... On, on the start of the film, where we kind of get the, the kind of familiar iconography of the Indiana, Indiana Jones series, from the typeface to the credits to the music to kind of the, the people kind of within the frame, um, the opening of this film, the first 25 minutes, felt, felt to me as a fan really lovely, mm. really lovely. Yeah. Uh, and I enjoyed it as that moment of this is giving me something of the, um, the earlier films. So we'll talk about kind of perhaps the de-aging in more detail kind oh, of around Oh, that. we will. <laughs> oh, we will. But it, it, it felt very comfortable to me. It was a, a really kind of a, a sense of, of kind of coming home, a yeah. bit like that. And I talk a lot about um, Harrison Ford as the, the kind of the uber legacy star building on this kind of branded nostalgia that, that Disney particularly, who've kind of produced the film, wants to kind of harness and I think fundamentally that the certainly the, the very opening sequence the first five minutes does that for a, a fan it, it, it kind of gives us the sense of that we are back in 1985 yeah. Temple of mm. Doom or something like that and I, as a fan I comfortably went with it mm. yeah uh, and I think perhaps other audiences other types of audience don't make that transition as comfortably as I perhaps did yeah yeah I, no, uh, so I'm going to, this is, this is me pretending I know loads about Star Wars and Indiana Jones when I don't, <laughs> but it seems like 
and, and, I, and I guess I'd fold Blade Runner, the, the new yeah. Blade Runner. Yeah. There's a sense in which you mentioned the legacy film and, and writers that have talked about franchises and the, and the legacy film. Uh, often, uh, whether it's the, the, the Rocky films and other franchises of which I have seen none, um, there's a sense in which the old star passes on the franchise to the young star and they kind of take it over. And in the case of the Creed, the Creed films, that is kind of creatively as much as the, the, the lead role. Um, but it seems like unlike Star Wars, where Ford is passing the, the, the baton of, of the of protagonist on, this film kind of doesn't do... It, it, it could easily have done that. And I remember some of the um, resistance to Kingdom of the Crystal Skull as the film was kind of progressing people were hoping that Shia yeah. Beth wasn't going to be the new and then obviously the film then plays with that by having Harrison Ford in the final wedding sequence yeah. of Crystal Skull snatch his hat back to yes, be like no I'm absolutely. still and there is and, and he does it again in the final shot of this film um so I, I it's a it's a legacy film but it's one that doesn't kind of use or well, it does use Harrison Ford in a particular way but it doesn't use him to get people bums on seats and then after 20 minutes Spoiler alert, doesn't kill him off yeah. and we're now with the younger brother, son, Which, which other uncle. films in franchises are doing yeah. very much and with, with some success and some not success. Yeah. But no, there's, and I think fundamentally, for me, that Dial of Destiny is a film about Harrison Ford. Mm. Yes. Much more than it is, in a way, about Indiana Jones. Um, and, and I think the, 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 the setup, the, the scene that, that you talked about, the, the very final scene is, is kind of encapsulating that. And I think the opening of it as well, doing that, yeah. as well it's the first really of the series where that opening kind of shot of Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones that we get here we are really being asked to contemplate Harrison Ford as we know him mm. he's not in Indiana Jones's costume he's, he's disguised as a Nazi but we are kind of given a relative close-up of his face um, kind of through this we're asked to kind of look at him as as the spectacle yeah. to get us into the film. That doesn't really happen so much in the others, you know, but they all have star entrances at various points. Um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, he, he, this shadowy figure emerges into the light, costumed in the hat and the, the, the jacket and everything and the theme tune kind of swells and you go, yes, okay, I'll come along on this adventure. Yeah. You've seen these films before, haven't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but it's not, you know, Harrison Ford isn't, isn't as central as the, 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 um, the silhouette, I think, and even in those moments. Uh, and it's played with, it's always really interesting across all of the films. How are these, how is Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones introduced at any point? Hmm. Uh, and they kind of shift with it. So something like Last, uh, Last Crusade, 1989, gives us a flashback opening again for 20 minutes again. So this is not unusual, what oh, we're getting. Right. And we get the younger Indiana Jones, but he's played by River Phoenix at that point. And we get um, a, a self-sustaining narrative adventure that reveals something about character, and then suddenly we, we kind of flash forward. And um, the hat comes down in a shot, River Phoenix's face disappears, it raises up, it is lifted, and it's Harrison Ford. And the, the theme tune swells, yep. it is Ford as Indiana Jones with all the iconography. What, we, what is partly notable about Dial of Destiny is that it's a, it takes a long time for us to get to that, that mode of Indiana Jones iconicity. Yep. In, even in that um, opening sequence, the hat and the whip are there, but they're inanimate. They're in a bag, they're kind of placed there. They get a little kind of note of music to kind of signal yeah, their yeah. presence. But it's much, much later before he puts it on. And we get that kind of moment. And what I think is really interesting in this film is that there, it's not marked in that way that it has been before. It's not a kind of mark of spectacle and finally, we're here. Something is kind of here, um, kind of exciting in this moment. It is, it's just there. We've already had the spectacle. And that has been the younger Harrison Ford yeah. kind of that we get. Um, and there was lots of kind of talk about should we recast, should, should, uh, is this Disney going to recast? What are they going to do with this? Um, and pre-production, lots of discussion around this because this was a lot of time in the pipeline, Dial of Destiny, um, waiting for the green light um, to go. And, and, and Ford is very, very clear at, at those points, talking in interviews, where I am playing him, when I am gone, he is gone, yeah. that's it. The, a real kind of finality. And I think what, what probably helped that is the sense of what happened around Star Wars, kind of from The Force Awakens onwards, where he kind of similarly had that kind of legacy moment that worked very, very well. and was very resonant emotionally mm -hmm. and, um, and also had kind of, kind of a finite moment, I guess, to it as well. 
Of course, what we really interestingly get after that is the release of Solo, a Star Wars story with uh, Alden Eric, right? Yeah. yeah. Which kind of did its business and everything, and it was clearly a moment of that recasting. Yeah. You know, is it going to work? What's going to happen? How are people going to feel about it? How does he perform as this iconic character? Mm. And, and I think fundamentally not seen as very successful, yeah. um, whether it's yeah. successful, whether it's kind of there or not. Yeah. So we've had that experiment of recasting a Harrison Ford yes. iconic role. It didn't work. Enough for Disney to potentially reshape their, their um, strategy around the Star Wars films. Uh, I've read kind of around yeah, it, the, yeah, the, yeah. the kind of the supposed failure of so Solo kind of made them think maybe this isn't the way to go. So suddenly Ford's in a position of power and saying, you can't recast me. Yeah. <laughs> it won't work. Yeah. So let's drill into that then, because um, there are other alternate, you know, I, I think one of the reasons, Chris, I might be a bit ambivalent about Indiana Jones is that we're both big James Bond fans. And yeah. essentially, I'm sort of like, what? Well, I don't need the whip. I need the tuxedo and the gun. Thank you very much. So, but, um, but obviously that is an example of a franchise where the, the central role is recast again and again and again. There's obviously Doctor Who, but there's also like Jurassic, the Jurassic World, yeah. which actually I'm not, I don't think they're great movies, but they do very well at the box office, yeah. right? So they've managed to do that intergenerational um, exchange much better. Now, obviously, this franchise has one problem in that the title of the character is the franchise, right? Yeah. So, but I wondered, you say the first 20 minutes feel like an Indiana Jones mm. movie, it felt. And I would agree with you. I, I thought, whether I like them or not, the fourth Kingdom of a Christmas, yeah. which I didn't hate, but it no. did feel weird. It felt yeah. not like an Indiana Jones movie, and this felt like one. So, what does is it complete? Is it tied to to Ford as a kind of uh, a figure of spectacle, or is or is there something else that defines Indiana Jones as well, an Indiana Jones? Yeah, movie I mean, that might make it able to be recast. You know, that the well, I mean, I, we, we can't kind of deny the <laughs> fact that it, it has been recast. There's a TV series sure. of the kind of I think in the '90s, the young Indiana Jones. Uh, kind of series around there, you know, River Phoenix is kind of, sure. kind of sure, sure. there have been kind of these modes and attempts to kind of do it. Um, it's, it's odd. I mean, the, the historical kind of mapping that I've done from Raiders of the Lost Ark all the way to Dial of Destiny um, shows kind of really quite clearly in kind of paratextual material, but also in kind of contract negotiations around and, and, and material like that, that Ford wasn't particularly important as an individual to yeah. begin with. He was there and he was, you know, uh, significant, but certainly publicity around Raiders of the Lost Ark um, talks far, far more about Lucas, George Lucas specifically, and Steven Spielberg as sure. these kind of um, selling points, kind of all the way around it. And it's only really with, I would arguably, Crystal Skull, 2008, yeah. That, that Harrison Ford really kind of gets to kind of, I guess, ratify his value as a star around that character. I think in a, in a sense of control. There was a lot of development again around um, Crystal Skull as uh, in development for a long time. They wanted to make the fourth film and reports suggest that Lucas and Spielberg were up for it, but Ford kept saying no. Hmm. So only at that point does he kind of come into it. And just kind of going back to the, the final sequence of Dial of Destiny that you talked about, Chris, where that, that idea of the, the costuming, the, the, the hat and the whip and the, the kind of iconography there of, of Indiana Jones as something that could be passed on, something that could be de-individualised. Yeah. Do you think there's a really lovely shot in Raiders of the Lost Ark where you just get the silhouette of Harrison Ford standing in the desert and he's just, you know, the hat and the, the kind of silhouette of Jones. You know, we, could, we should be able to replace this mm. should just be a man in a hat basically yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think what what is going on at the end of Dial of Destiny is that kind of embodiment of Ford's own statement saying this isn't going to go further than this mm. we get this kind of iris in yep. um, as a very final statement the hat is just lying there passive I think on a washing line yep. in, a new, in New York yep. you know there for the taking it kind of mythically it should be kind of saying this could go further and, and it's a very, much more so than Crystal Skull's final moment, playing with Ford, playing around with the hat. It's a very deliberate, violent gesture of pulling back and controlling that hat yeah. and kind of going, not mine, not for you. Yeah. Um, and, and an action, a, a firm, yeah. if you like, a firm hand kind of going, mine. Yeah. I'm still there while I can. So I think, I think that, I mean, who knows really what's going to happen um, in terms of, the films. I think the, fl the fact that it's been 
seen as a yes. flop probably will stop it. Yeah. And will can continue that as a kind of a Ford, Harrison Ford only kind of moment around it. Well, I, 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 I had a question yeah. as somebody who, I mean, my knowledge of Harrison Ford and Clint Eastwood are not great. Um, I've not watched many. I've, I've, I'm now going through a cycle of watching kind of Harrison Ford action movies of the seven. So I just wondered, in terms of your like Ford, it's just it seems interesting. We talked actually yeah. um, uh, about kind of more recent work that he's doing on television um, in two shows. I can't remember the name of one of them, but the other one is Shrinking. He's in one of the Yellowstone. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and Shrinking has a lot of fun with his yeah. aged body. Uh, but I don't know much about his career trajectory in terms of particular moments in his career when he was that kind of star, when he moved towards those kinds of movies. Yeah. Was he a genre star? I, again, I, I have seen, I've basically seen What Lies Beneath and Air yeah. Force One. That's it, really. <laughs> and so I'm just kind of interested in, in a person who is central to two huge franchises um, who seems to work across different... Genres, loosely speaking. I mean, we could add in three franchises because he's the first Jack Ryan. Really, he is the first well, Jack not Ryan. the first Jack Ryan. He, yeah. He's the one who kind of brings Jack Ryan who isn't into, a, into a, a multiverse or kind of yeah, yes, yeah. picture as well. Uh, yes. So, so, uh, what? Why is he in? Why is he interesting then, as somebody who does all these different things? Um, because I guess I'm thinking of scholarship on ageing and, and the idea of... And, and scholarship on ageing that has looked at Clint Eastwood and Robert Redford and yeah. that distinction between... Um, Donna Peabody says that it's kind of the distinction between rotting and ripening masculinity. You either age and grunt and, uh, and you're Clint Eastwood in Gran Torino or you sort of ripen and you're Robert Redford. And you're the, that, the last film I think he did was when he was a kind of... Um, like a bank robber, robber, like a smooth bank robber. I can't yeah, remember, yeah. Again, I can't remember the name of The Mule or something like that. Really I, don't, I don't know, I can't remember. So there's a kind of weird, I don't know. Oh, no, that's Clint Eastwood. That's oh, Clint Eastwood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that kind of rickety versus ripening. And I and what's, what I found interesting about this film, and, and that you're, you have to hold both of those contradictory identities at the same time, because he's old and crusty and hangs his washing up on a washing line indoors and tells his neighbours to turn the yes. music down. But he's also, of course, he's an action star and hangs out the back of a car or a tuk-tuk yeah. or whatever. It's just right. So I, I thought it was really interesting that it was holding almost a con these contradictory things together that seemed perfectly embodied by Harrison Ford, yeah. actually. That he's, he can do both of those things kind of simultaneously and within one movie. Yeah. Yes, I think so. It's... Um so we get, and at that, at that's we've, we've kind of talked about this, and it's certainly been identified as one of the issues about the de-age sequence. Is as soon as that figure starts to move, oh yeah, yeah, it becomes not Harrison Ford because he's he's very distinctive as much as anything else. And clearly, he was I think seventy nine when he filmed it. <laughs> he's you know he isn't doing that mm. uh, at certain points. He's not move, certainly not moving along a train. He'll be kind of doing other things like punches and, and stuff like that. I mean, it's an odd one with with Ford. Um, he's. I think we, to some degree, we f forget a little bit in that kind of ripening, kind of kind of rottening kind of metaphor. Yeah. He he was always a bit older as a star. Yeah, yeah. Kind of from it, you know, he wasn't really kind of he didn't become a star until about forty, really. And even in Raiders of the Lost Ark, the the one that really kind of cements this idea of Harrison Ford as a star figure, um, as a valuable figure, he's still kind of a bit stiff, a little bit old, a bit kind of crotchety certainly yeah. and kind of all that way and it, he's an academic kind of, yeah, <laughs> say, yeah but also believably yeah academic yeah academic as well yeah. as well as the kind of the, the the kind of the almost swashbuckling particularly kind of in this film where none of his students are actually listening to him as yeah. opposed to the, yeah. the, the first film where they're hanging on his yes. every word it'll, right? it'll yeah. be in the final exam fine I'll spoon feed <laughs> yeah, it to you yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. that's why I like, yeah. like yeah. Dial of Destiny because yeah. I really kind of quite so quite yeah but he believably you said, so I hadn't realised that he so he was born in in 42 so that means yeah, Raiders of the Lost Ark would be yeah. 40. Yeah. So I didn't realise he was a kind of aged... Like, or he was, he was yeah. 40. I mean, even when you look back at Star Wars, he's always kind of... He's yeah. the older figure kind of in it. That so, so that raises the question then, in a film... Like, or the, in a franchise like Indiana Jones, if we're saying that Dial of Destiny, you know, the uncanniness is... OK, the de-aging is quite good, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the uncanniness comes from the um, tension between the youth and face and a body that doesn't move like we know Harrison Ford has yeah. historically moved. Yeah. It makes me think that in 
all of the other movies, you have stunt people like Vic Armstrong. And so Harrison Ford has often not been, if he, if he was an older star at kind of 40 and, and Raiders of the Lost Ark's made in 81, there are probably loads of sequences in all of the Indiana Jones movies where it's not Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford yeah. is one of five or six. Yeah. So actually the technology is only really sharpening um, this issue of kind of stunt, stunt performers anyway, like the idea that, that this technology is, uh, well, it's, he's too old now to, now to do it, so we've got this younger body in. Well, it seems like he was always too old to do some of these stunts yeah, anyway, I'll, so I'll actually look, he's, yeah. he's, been, he's one of a number of Indiana Joneses in this franchise, yes, and some are technology and some are not. And it's always interesting because the, the stunt work was a hu huge kind of uh, promotional point of the first couple of films, yeah. certainly. And, and Luke has always conceived of ca the, whoever they cast as Indiana Jones as a kind of a stunt performer who could act. And Ford was on the list just as a type. It'll be somebody like him, yeah. that kind of sense. Um, so the stunts, the idea of, of physicality, I think, has always been really important. Um, and Ford, let's face it, is very physical and very fit, yeah. even at 79. And we can talk about, oh, look at the kind of frail and... Um, the frail body that we get in, but that seems a performance as that. that, that exactly, yeah. yeah, so he's old, but that, the the oldness of him seems. You're right. He is physically fit for yes, somebody. Yes, he is. <laughs> he's 70, 79 at that yeah. point, and and, he, and and that's another spectacle of it. Yeah. I think that why this film is really about Harrison Ford more than anything else. You know, we get the second spectacle of the the, the actual aged Ford body, kind of in in his first sequence in the kind of uh, the was it 1969 yeah. he's you know he doesn't have a shirt on and he's in boxes i think you know yeah. there aren't many that, that would kind of lend themselves i think to kind of that visual spectacle and again we're asked to kind of contemplate it i think kind of around it what does it mean and of course thematically it fits in with with what the film is about the film is about time and yeah. shifts between past and present with the the, the kind of the, the, the mechanism that drives the plot the um, you know as with all of yeah. let's face it the, the Indiana Jones films there is a kind of mythical object that is searched for and we've got the Antikythera yeah. mechanism here you know the idea of, of shifting kind of back and forward in time is, is kind of yeah. just been built into it but it's also the, the it's also the second that the the eponymous dial is the second of the mythical things because the first one this lance that's revealed in the opening is revealed to be quote it's a fake and a reproduction and I thought well this whole sequence is mm. about fakery mm -hmm. and about replication mm. um, and yeah I, I, I thought in, in the spirit of this podcast always talking about things that are about animation I was like oh this is a really interesting 20 minute and we, we've had conversation I remember when I was first thinking about digital de-aging and the, the distinction between invisible digital beauty effects and then these self-reflexive sequences that are we are now back in time yeah. look at what we can do with a computer so this is a, a long 20, 25 minute sequence of a digitally de-aged um, Harrison Ford and Mads Mikkelsen. Um, but it seems to also be a response to a kind of anticipation of, well, people aren't going to like this, or people are going to, there's going to be a question around fakery. Or, mm -hmm. And it seems to be one of the first, in, uh, maybe C Captain Marvel is similar in the way that it's playing with time and, and stuff but this felt like a really interesting to, act, to, to start with the film's MacGuffin that is, the, that is like the real MacGuffin of the film that's never really talked about again this, this Lance that's revealed to be a fake and I thought all of this stuff around we're witnessing history yesterday belongs to us Dr. Jones all this the, 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 it seemed to be a kind of commentary on maybe, it, maybe that's too, too simplistic a reading but it seemed interesting that it was, it was setting up something that that then it disregards in, in a quite a playful fashion. There's also the kind of issue of fakery to disguise deeper fakery. Or uh, Well, you, you yes. will know more about this than I, both of you will know more about this, idea, but there's always this question of who gets de aged, yep. right? And yep. you said Mad, Mads Mikkelsen is de aged. If, I'm sure he is, but there's something very different in the register of de aging with Mads Mikkelsen. I mean, the one thing, just the practicality of it, I mean, he's. How old's the guy? The guy's like late 50s now, is he? 60, early 60s. Um, Mads Mikkelsen now. Um, I'm assuming he's not de aged. In, in 58. The, 58 yeah. in the current thing. So that would make him, according to the timeline of this movie, what, late 20s mm -hmm. when it's supposed to be? Yeah. He certainly doesn't look in his yeah. late 20s. He was born in 1965. Um, in, yeah. in, you know, he's kind of got that, well, he's got the more kind of Hollywood age slipperiness where really what they've done is dyed his hair 
um, and shot him in a but kind of. I mean, well, it not, looks like that anyway. But he also embodies at that moment more of Hollywood's kind of slippageness of kind of European identities and oh, interchangeabilities yeah, sure. kind of around that. So he's he's not a fixed point. No, you're really quite right, in, yes. in any regard. Yes, I think he's now done it all, hasn't he? Yeah. He's probably has he played a Russian? He's definitely played a Nazi <laughs> now. Um, yeah. He's played Hannibal. Um, he was in the last Harry Potter. Yeah. He's in the yes, Marvel has, universe, the yeah, Star Wars yeah, films. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're quite right. Yeah. So we have that as well. So there's something odd about the the register as we're asked to see these two characters because we're not being asked to see the spectacle of Mads no. Mikkelsen de age no. in the same way are Harrison Ford and then the other thing we don't have which I guess is, a, is, is something of a mission so am I criticising the movie for not doing something I guess I am I was convinced throughout this entire movie because I knew um, Karen see this is where the fans Karen are Allen. Show, Karen yeah, Allen yeah. I knew she was in it yes but once we got a time travelling plot, I got right. Okay, we're going back to Raiders. We're going to see Raiders again. Karen Allen's going to be de-aged. Women don't moment. get de-aged, Alex. But, but women uh. do not get de-aged <laughs> unless you're Sean Young in. Um, Blade Runner. Because you don't really get de-aged; you just get fixed. Which it's not even her; it's her yeah, face it's on someone else's body. Yeah, yeah. That's not the point of it. She, right, yeah, she sure. doesn't get de-aged. Yeah, yeah. Fine. Yeah, yeah. She so, gets she gets literally replaced. So that's so so. I don't know. What 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 have we got to say about who well, gets de-aged and who doesn't yeah. in this movie? Yeah. Well, I, I say in the context of the franchise, it makes to me again kind of. Um, I guess, but perhaps this is kind of more of the kind of like yes it's it's a fine film it's okay <laughs> I liked it I, I, um, I'm, I'm with it uh, I, I can see it's flaws all of the Indiana Jones films have flaws N they are not perfect films in any regard kind of around it um, but we've already had that story of connecting with Marion the Karen Al Al Allen character in Crystal Skull that's the key point of kind of um, performative tension and the, the enjoyment of the, the tense, uh, tension between the relationships we've got there. And she's fantastic in it. Mm -hmm. It's one of the, the, work, the, the, the things I think that, that does really work about Crystal Skull. And that there's an enjoyment again of, oh, it's just good to see them spar. So it made sense to not do that again in this film mm -hmm. um, and she appears at the end as a moment of kind of closure again a moment of closure and mm. it's, it's also interesting I guess to some degree in the last two films how Marion and Karen Allen has also become a fixed point of I guess legitimacy and authenticity around the film she is an integral part of the story in, in a way that you know the two films in the middle don't yeah, make yeah, anything yeah. off yeah. Um, but I think as far as I can tell she I'm sure I read something that said that she's, she's you know wearing a grey wig if this isn't her <laughs> at this point yeah. she is kind of aged up I think kind of to, to really? look frail and yeah. kind of frailer and stuff like that yeah. so I think there's still an element of change going on there and an untruth if you like um, around yeah. it but I mean I, I the, the, the gender stuff is something that is is definitely omitted from my my well uh, sidelined I would say I tried to, to bring it in um, into the stuff I've written on de-aging but um Again, we, we talked about this this sort of who yes who gets to, to be de aged. There are sort of gender and and um, kind of racial politics connected to, to this. Um, I would say the in terms of uh, gender women yeah there's there's one or two digits de de aged. So I would say Sean Young but isn't really de aged in the same way. It's no, not no, her no. pro filmic that is being sort of amended. Same That's with the, uh, Princess Leia technique. Um, it's Carrie Fisher's. Yeah. Uh, it's Billy Lord um, being kind of. Um, I think it's. Uh, Ingrid Valor's body with um, the DH Carrie Fisher on top, or something like this. And then there's uh, Michelle Pfeiffer in the Ant Man sequel, and I think that is digital de aging. I think she is kind of pro filmic and is being sort of, but But that, I'm. I'm struggling. I think there's another one in, in that um, terrible Ryan Reynolds film. Which one? Um, the, the time traveling, the Adam Project. I think right. there's a there's a, a, a female, Catherine Keener. Catherine Keener is digitally yeah. de-aged, but mostly it's it's 1980s act. So you know Stallone, uh, Pacino, De Niro, Ma uh, Kurt Russell, Michael Douglas. Like there's a there's a grouping of, and then there are people that may or may not be de-aged, such. Uh, we, we won't, I haven't got time to talk about Tom Cruise, but people like Tom Cruise and Hugh Jackman who may or may not be, be being tweaked in, in post-production in, in certain kinds of things. Mostly it's a particular image of white masculinity and, yeah, and people yeah. like Drew Ayers have written about the kind of transactional nature of white masculinity that it kind of shows the interchangeability and certainly with online deep fakes and the way in which certain faces are swapped. Often it's white faces for white faces. Very rarely do, do people kind of swap across gender or racial lines. It's it's about the sort of a transactional masculinity between we could just easily put Christian Bale's face or, or Tom Cruise's face on this other. Not we could swap them quite easily because 
you know, there's a certain um, degree of sameness to the way that, that Hollywood treats its white male stars. I think as well is in that as soon as you kind of put particularly a female um, identities into the kind of the, the face swapping stuff, I think the question of exploitation immediately shoots to the top. Mm-hmm. Who, how are they being exploited? What's the point of this? Because on the whole, why are men doing it to them? And um, there's quite a, mm. an, a, a, a clip that I showed um, my students um, of uh, a real time kind of uh, rendering face swap on a live uh, streaming broadcast of a, you could see the kind of the, um, the, the streamer suddenly on camera become Margot Robbie. His face is literally kind of being spliced, reskinned with Margot Robbie kind of yeah. on it. And it's kind of convincing in that kind of element. And suddenly you kind of go, Ugh. It, it, and the deep fake porn stuff. It's, yep. it's all that kind of idea of, it, it raises questions of control, agency, responsibility, all of those things. Whereas a lot of the discourse, particularly that um, Dial of Destiny was used for, was to talk really about kind of the responsibility of this. This is a, this is a benign process of um, digital transformation that somebody, i.e. Ford, consents to and is kind mm-hmm. of very um, in, in control of. Uh, and a lot of the discourse talked around the, the legitimacy of using the kind of the, the, the real historical image of, of uh, Ford in Temple of Doom and Raiders of the Lost Ark that was then used in ILM's kind of face finder AI program to kind of sort through and find it. And there's multiple quotes of, that you can find of Ford in interviews at the time going, that's real, it's my face, yeah. it's me, it's not a digital composite. And there's also a sense that the, this, the, the, um, the discussions around this film, because there were so much discussions about this DH sequence, mm. yeah. um, there, are, there is other stuff to talk about in the film, but yeah. we'll we never do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, but it was a sense of, you know, uh, we, have, we are moving away from the kind of the, the, um, the inauthentic digital image of CGI, um, computer kind of what they call it kind of modeling yeah yeah no no this is a kind of an ai created version of me it's not quite accurate in terms of it but in terms of if you just listen to kind of the journalistic discourse around it you'd think it was generative ai being used wholly to create the new real harrison ford and i think that's why we get that first shot of his face kind of so tight we are asked to look at how realism has shifted yeah this is something we know so so are we saying before we 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 leave the aging behind and Return to it in the spirit of the time travel film. Um, uh, uh, so are we saying then that the sort of the, the the repeated use of male stars as testing grounds yeah. for this kind of technology versus female stars who are either one not allowed to get old in and of themselves, two are then not de-aged. You know, we're not we're not going to see a digitally de-aged Helen Mirren or Judy Dench or Meryl Streep, one of the th- the, the three that are untouchable. Uh, and in and, and and actually, when we when we do see younger versions of female stars, they are often just lookalikes or the daughter of Kim Basinger. Or I, and, and I did wonder whether the the sort of 11, 12 year old Phoebe Waller Bridge mm. was some kind of relative, some kind of distant, because there was a kind of, kind of yeah. similarity there. So, are, are we saying that that sort of the repeated use of white masculinity as a, as a sort of testing ground means uh, invites invites a consideration of, of kind of trust and authentication that if it was a female star, the rhetoric would shift and it would be more about exploitation yeah. and more it would be more about how is the the, the one doesn't ask of Harrison Ford, how did you feel being poked and prodded by all of these computers? And like that, m- Men don't have but, those questions asked of them. And also particularly Harrison Ford, because yeah. his public persona is so kind of gruff and sour and uh, in a fun sure. way that he'd tell us. It's yeah. that idea that he, he speaks, you know, yeah. he, he would you know, tell, it, tell it like it is, if you like, kind of yeah. around that. So he's quite a safe person to be doing this with because you know, if, if, if it's something kind of that... Um, would be kind of exploitative. We'd hear about it. So yeah. those discourses of trust aren't don't don't quite they sit well with yeah. figures like Ford and, and but they don't sit as well or or aren't even present in the way that w- the, the discourse around Sean Young, as we said earlier, yeah. is that her, her fate she was used as an image and and she wasn't even allowed to play a younger version of herself. She was kind of abstracted from the process. She was she was kind of positioned as a below the line like stunt worker who we don't really know. We don't really know who they are. So that, that I think, is interesting, that kind of register. And again, something that the discourse around, that the, the panic around deepfakes and de-aging is now moved on to the extent that we can unpack some of the gnarliness, I think, of, the, of de-aging technology and how it's used in particular ways and how, in this film, it's set up as a kind of spectacle because he is heard, Harrison Ford is heard before 
he is seen because he even has mm. the bag over his head. So there's lots of processes of veiling that's going on, I think. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Shall we, should we move on and talk about the rest of the movie? Yeah, gonna, uh, we can. <laughs> we must. Yeah, we yeah, can. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... Where should we go next? Should we talk about Phoebe Waller-Bridge? You mentioned uh, her just yes. a second ago. Thoughts? I'm not sold on Phoebe Waller-Bridge, but I think there's something very interesting that she's now been in two franchise vehicles, both of which are have the shadow and the, indeed the presence of Harrison Ford surrounding all of them. And mm-hmm. She was also the robot, wasn't she, in yes. Solo, yeah. a Star yeah. Wars story? Yeah. So it seems like the go-to, what do we need to do to inject an old Harrison Ford vehicle with life and vitality? Let's get Phoebe Waller-Bridge in. Yeah. Um, so I guess, a, I guess a question as somebody who doesn't know the franchise as well, is she taking on a role that is familiar in those films? No, uh, Since she's the token, the, da, 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 or what's there's happening? There's always a s- sidekick. Is there always one? Well, there's, 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 there's a young boy. There's yeah, always a young the, boy, isn't the, there? The, the, the across the first trilogy, the, kind of the one in the 80s, there's always a love interest. Yeah. Harrison Ford. That's the kind of main female ro- role in it. Um, there's, um, but but not always kind of the primary relationship. I think kind of from it. So in Temple of Doom, you've also got Short Round, the the, the kind of the young character. Um, that, that's a really kind of lifeblood of that that film as well. You've clearly Last Crusade is much more about his relationship with Sean Connery mm-hmm. as his father than it is about the kind of particular love interest. Um, in the film, mm-hmm. then of course, by the time you get to Crystal Skull, Marion's back, and it's that kind of element. But well, we also have Mutt. And we uh, have Mutt. Uh, so there, so is, actually, there is this kind of three part. I was going to say there are th- through it. So there are three. F- there are three out of the five Indiana Jones films are about generations yes, and aging absolutely. and stuff. So yeah. Last Crusade, yeah. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and Dial of Destiny. Yeah. So actually, so again, this film feels more typical yeah. yes. than. If there's a lot about yeah, yeah a lot that is uh, continuous. Oh right, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. I, I hadn't, I hadn't, hadn't put that together. I thought, <laughs> oh, this is okay. This is the film where they're doing aging now because he's seventy nine or whatever. Mm-hmm. And and I again reading some of the pre release material, thinking about that the, the aging narrative wasn't Mangold, who's also done Logan, of yeah, course, yeah, you know, yeah, a film yeah, about sure. aging kind of superheroism. Like there's a there's a way in which the, the the aging narrative didn't quite wasn't quite done as well as it should have been in mm-hmm. Crystal Skull. So this is kind of doing it properly. Yeah, it seems like the last three of these movies have I been think about with this. Crystal Skull, it's it's a Certainly to begin with, because the, the beginnings of these films are, are always important about positioning where the character thinks he is at any point, you know, how, how kind of stable he is. That was about him being kind of out of his time, even in the 50s. Yes. Uh, that, that point of it. Lots, lots of all my back and yes, exactly, yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. And which we don't really get. But, we get a lot of sitting down chases. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, yeah, um, yeah. but I think what's also interesting in, in just thinking about uh, kind of Ford again as just a presence illuminating really I think kind of what, what, how the, the, the last film unfolds you know there's, a, there's quite an, a, a, a sequence where he rides a horse kind of through yeah, yeah. New York kind of from it and you think oh come on and you know obviously at various points he's, his head is superimposed onto kind of yeah even I can yeah, see yeah, that yeah absolutely and, and it's really clumsy at certain points as well but it's also odd because Ford um, certainly in, in, the, in the 80s was con- constructed as this kind of Montana figure living on a ranch with horses kind of through that and he's in the kind of we said the Yellowstone yeah. Creek horse he, him on a horse even at 79 isn't unbelievable mm. he is he yeah, can do yeah. it he's capable of it he will be riding there at some point it's not a total fabrication um, although at certain points obviously it is kind of through there so, uh, and we there were lots of publicity shots of him on the horse because I think they were filming that in there was it somewhere in the UK. It oh, I think, I think it's yeah, Scotland, yeah, Glasgow. Glasgow yeah. I think, yep. So that was a really kind of image that circulated the kind of the, the, the odd virility of of the aging kind of Harrison Ford come mm-hmm. through that. So I think it's less about being out of one's time that Crystal mm. Skull is, but is very much a dialogue between past and present. Because what it interests me again about the the, the opening sequence is it, it's a flashback. It's meant to be the past. However, in the context of all the Indiana Jones franchise, it marks the present. It's a 40-year-old Harrison Ford fighting mm. the Nazis. That is what we assume is the present contemporaneous of, yeah. of Indiana Jones. Yeah. So Phoebe Waller-Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. I, I think my... I couldn't get... Her, her character is slippery in a way that I can't quite figure out her, because sometimes she's the antagonist, sometimes she's the duplicitous sort of, sorry, and locks the, the gate behind her and runs away. Sometimes and then other she's times... Sometimes trauma-filled, sometimes she's wise-cracking. Yeah, sometimes, she's, yeah. sometimes yeah, they yeah. seem to have no beef whatsoever when they're going, da 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 in the cave, or yeah. they're having these really quite intimate moments between kind of goddaughter and, and godfather. So I was... 
she's really slippery, and maybe that's where the film. And it, and it doesn't matter who plays the, the role. I think her character type yeah. is particularly uh, ambivalent and a little bit kind of chaotic in a way that isn't sort of grounded. I think that's also linked to this, this, this status that she has to have as kind of goddaughter. You know, yeah. not not anything really tangible kind of from it because how yeah. else do you explain it? And, and doesn't she say what is a goddaughter yeah, or exactly. what is a goddaughter anyway or what is a, and that really well, she, she does, does but she's also really like there's this you know line about you know when my father died only, only if only there was someone predestined to take over in case my father like she's quite mm. angry, like they make a big deal about the mm. goddaughter thing in a way that I don't think I understand uh, the cultural significance of. I mean, the, 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 the main reason being that they've sort of tried the sun angle and yeah. they weren't going to put Shia LaBeouf in it again, yeah. so. Sort of yeah. And they've without, tried the dad angle as yeah, well. Tried, yeah. they, can't, they can't really go on that. There's also a long lost yeah, daughter. Right. Um, you know, yeah. so. and, and she obviously it has to work through that contrivance, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. And then she is the um, I'm going to quickly look up the sort of the little boy. Yeah. She's hey, yeah. She's sort of I can't remember how the film sets up their relationship. Sort she, of a guardian yeah, sort of. So right. she, she's also caught between yeah. two different roles. She you know this this father figure let's say who 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 is also in it like to- more films should have Toby Jones in and yeah. for longer but sure. that's a that's a separate issue um, that she's caught between two different roles. So yeah, I, I don't know. I think. I mean, I think what is interesting about. Uh, her casting and her performance as kind of Phoebe Waller-Bridge there is that she's got a very kind of quite distinct and and I think for this moment unique sense of timelessness you see her in the kind of costumes of of the 70s and absolutely appropriate running around the streets of New York Mm -hmm. but then in the Tangiers kind of sequence she's dressed in in very kind of 40s-esque kind of clothing as well and she looks absolutely fine there I know it's not 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 the 40s but it may as well be that kind of sense of it um and I think that's important, again, in terms of the slippage between past and present that the film is trying to negotiate, that, that you get somebody who can belong comfortably in a lot of different eras mm. and through that. And I think her performance, it's, it's clearly that kind of, kind of wisecracking, kind of almost screwball kind of heroine yes. type of mm-hmm, mm-hmm. character uh, that, that Marion was. I mean, mm-hmm. she is very much harking back to kind of what, what Marion is in, in, in that first film, m- m- much more than the other kind of women in the film in the franchise sequence. So I think that they're quite canny about that. And well, what do we need here? We need somebody who isn't sexual in the way that we have constructed them in the past. We need somebody who can who can kind of belong to comfortably in the Indiana Jones kind yes. of world from the 40s to the, the mm-hmm. 70s virtually. Um, and also not be not be too too defined as a particular type of, of kind of character relationship. She's got to be able to kind of move between that. I mean yeah, that could also be a flaw. No, absolutely. No, 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 no. I, 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 I'm, I, you know, I actually, you know, I love. I think Fleabag is incredible. Mm. I, yep. I, you know, I think I, I, it's more. I don't think Hollywood's quite worked out yes. what to do with Phoebe Waller Bridge, yeah. and I'm not sure this film quite knows what to do. Somebody, with it. and it might have been Ford has said this of her that she could be a star if she wants to be. Yeah. That sense of, and also I think that sense of kind of control and power that, that is really important to her character in the film that you can see as we've been talking mm. is clearly representative of how she is seen behind the scenes, you know, the, the, the hand on the Bond script, that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. This, is, I, this is not I, mere performer, if you like. I, I think the film isn't quite sure whether she's the wide, whether she's short round, yeah. uh, if she's the wide cracking sidekick main to kind of bring a bit of life and mirth to the thing, or whether there's real dramatic heft in this kind of goddaughter yes. sequence. And, and I, don't, I don't think there is dramatic heft. No, I don't it. think there is either. And I think that's potentially one of the, the issues with the film is that there's never anything at stake in that relationship in a way that there is mm. certainly with uh, uh, Henry Jones Sr., Sean yeah. Connery in Last Crusade. You know, there's something very... And, you know, the idea of the sun in Cre- Cre- yeah, Cre- yeah, 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 sure. uh, Crystal Skull and, Ma- and re- mm. reconnecting with Marion. There's something very kind of clearly at stake and, in all those moments. And the bit where you find out Mutt's fate is actually yeah. quite, it's yeah. quite yeah. affecting, you know. Like it it's, is, you know, yeah. um, Despite not having a much affection to that character... Yeah. Um, from the film, but uh, but the way Ford delivers it and the kind of the, the reconciliation with him and, uh, and Marion is like you know mm-hmm. that works. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I had a question actually about the diminished stakes of this kind of god daughter relationship. I, what do, do you think that the, the diminished stakes of it um, are to do with the, the are to do with the film's negotiation of time? Because there's a lot of this happened then flashback. Then it's how we are now. Then that happened then, and then we're in the fifties, fifty one. And then there's another bit, and then we go back even further, yeah. and, and so all of the time hopping doesn't allow enough time yeah. for there to be meaningful 
sequences. Yes. So I, I don't I think, know, structurally... I think that, that is true, um, because one of the things that's potentially a, a different here as well is that the supporting cast don't quite get their moments. Yeah. I think that we expect... And we've yeah. got, like you say, Toby Jones is here. You know, and he gets his yeah. scenes and everything, but it's not quite the same as what, let's say, Denham Elliott gets sure. across a couple of films. Or even Ray Winston, yeah, or John yeah. Hurt, or somebody like that. And then we've got Antonio Banderas yeah, as sure. the, the the captain that takes them to the underwater adventure. And I was, and it took me a minute to go. That is Banderas, isn't yeah. it? What's he doing here? And and <laughs> and why is why isn't he doing more? Yeah. Really? He didn't he describe his role as almost or like not quite a cameo. It's yes. sort, and then he gets second billing or something like that. Yeah. So yeah, it it uh, doesn't quite not know what to do with its it, people. Mapping yes. that onto the various time frames also kind of highlights this kind of fragmented nature. Right, we've got mm -hmm. Toby Jones only exists with a de-aged Harrison Ford, yes. so we never get. He's a character of the past. Yeah, yeah. he's a character yeah. only of the past. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Antonio Banderas only in the present, at least according to this movie. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, then we've got the Mads Mikkelsen, and same with Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Mads Mikkelsen and Harrison Ford liminally between the two worlds. But you've got the weird link between Phoebe Bridge, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, and um, Toby Jones yep. is, and like they're kind of there together, but they're not together. Um, yeah, the, the way stardom is dispersed yes. throughout the various time zones also adds to this. But, but actually, then the, I think the key thing is when Antonio Banderas is killed, and Phoebe Waller-Bridge finds the whole thing superb and wonderful, and yes. is laughing, yeah. and Harrison Ford's like, "No, I've just lost one of my dearest friends," and she, and that that. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that tonal yeah. that that that's the issue is that it doesn't quite know the, the sort of the stakes of one relationship versus the lack of and yeah. characters not aware of the stakes the of stakes, relationships yes. maybe that's it there is that kind of odd bubble that she's in i mean if we talk about it in their terms of that as well we've got the return of john reese davis yeah. salah course, yeah. obligatory bomb it. reference yeah. um, and, and again it, it's something that that I, I understand completely why it's there i particularly like it actually the inclusion of it as a way of, of, of thinking about just the scope and scale of the Indiana Jones kind of universe, I guess, in terms of time, from the, the, the 30s really kind of onwards. And the idea that a character in Raiders of the Lost Ark becomes an American immigrant. You know, the idea that, that, that what was kind of the world of the Nazis is now the world of kind of hope and prosperity mm. that, that, that you know, having an American friend allows for. And, mm. and I think that's a really interesting inclusion into the film. Um, I don't necessarily particularly mm. like the scene. I think it's quite clumsy. Yeah. Um, and I think as time goes on, the cast, in particular of John Rhys Davis, in an, the role as an Egyptian, becomes more and more mm -hmm. problematic. Sure, sure, sure. Particularly when he talks, he kind of kind of goes, "Give him hell, Jones," and he may, because he's Welsh anyway. Sure. Jonesy, you know, it's it's it's, yeah. it's so kind of there, yeah, yeah. Kind of there. <laughs> um, and I don't think. I think that there's, oh, there's nice <laughs> elements to it, but but I don't think that quite works. Either. Yeah. So I think for, for me, um, the, the kind of the, 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 some of the flaws of, of the film are very much in, in, in not really knowing how to treat the supporting cast. I think that's a wider problem in how ensemble films are yeah, developing yeah. in in Hollywood. You know, there's a long, long history of of, of, of even star-driven films, but but that have kind of the time for character actors. Yeah. And knows what their value is and what they should be doing within the space of two five-minute sequences, and and it, this is still they're still present here because it's still part of the franchise, mm -hmm. and we expect that kind of structure. But I think fundamentally, right in terms of writing and, and kind of I guess editing and, and directing, we're not really the, the filmmakers more broadly perhaps haven't don't really know what to do with these characters anymore to make them. Mm. Anything other than present, they yeah. don't. They don't become more than that. Yeah, I, I felt that way. I was just looking her up. The I felt that way about the CIA agent, Agent Mason. Yes, yeah. I felt that way about her and the sort of the, the way in which the film signals the uh, kind of bad Nazis. Where I think Mads Mikkelsen's asking the the kind of the bellhop, where is he from originally? Yes, and, yeah, and yeah. these kind of little the little clumsy bits where I was like, well, I'm not, I'm not quite sure how that's worked. So I, I, I agree, I think that the film doesn't quite know what to do with its supporting cast. And um, But I quite like the henchmen, I thought they were quite cool. But yeah. I thought Agent Mason, yeah, I didn't, that sort of, uh, as, a, as a black female in that world, I felt the film could have done a bit more, a bit more with her. Particularly where we're in 1960. 1969. 1969, yeah. a black FBI agent in 1969 
you've got to do something more interesting than kind of that, right? Um, um, <laughs> to, shoot her, to shoot her on a plane, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know what, yeah, exactly. Either you lean into the tension or you kind of make a joke. I don't know what you do with it, but that's... But you do something You do with something it. Yeah. with it, and that's quite yeah. a sort of, yeah, vacuous role, really, isn't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, these, these, the, these ciphers are there, you know, Salah becomes just cipher of... of yeah. Immigration. She, she mm. is a, clearly a cipher of you know, potential change, but not quite there yet. They're not really given. And I think that elements of that is kind of you've got to trust the performer to do something with these as well, even if they're kind of un underwritten. Mm. So yes, which that's you, you true. do get, I think, much more in the other films. Yes. Okay. So that's that's we're skipping through the film nimbly here, but we get we get the kind of the adventure. We get the map, of course. With uh, the, yeah. So the map with the even I love the map. Even I. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but I hasn't uh, hasn't. I've probably said this before. Hasn't in, in Victor Perkins's uh, stuff on fictional worlds, where is the world? He talks about, you know, you, you don't need to show an event in a fictional world to know that it's kind of happened. Sure. And he talks about animated, he talks about animated maps and the dotting and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's enough to, I don't look at that and go, well, that journey never happened. Like it's a sort of, he, he does, he mentions, I think. So when that map came up, I wrote animation used to show yeah. the journey. Perkins. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> it's a weird thing, the map though, isn't yeah, it? That's all I have to say. It's so fun and exciting. Even though it's just silly. It's John Williams. It's John Williams. It's also partly the kind of score. score. I, I it's John Williams. Of, I, pro I have talked far too much, I guess, about Harrison Ford as a kind of like it's about him. I mean, Williams is still there. He is still very much a kind of clearly yeah. important presence to, to these films. Um, and the power of the music. You can't yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, well yeah, given yeah, that yeah. this is the first film to not be directed by Spielberg, yeah. these kinds of continuous yeah. authors become really important. So. Ford, yes. Because it um, does have Williams' last score, I think, as well. Oh, really? Because he's 90. Yeah. I, I assume he didn't do it, actually. So no, he, he, he so that, that's the sort of... We, we, and he also we, went, that's it, I'm done. Oh, so, right. Yeah. So there you go. So that so so it's ageing... So actually, that make, that's interesting that it's the ageing of Harrison Ford, but it's also, you know, it's, it's Lucas who's now pretty much sort of... only and he's not involved at all. No. So it's this sort of... And, and if Williams is this is his last one, it's sort of... It's the it's the the world of Indiana yes. Jones. It's the people yeah. that are involved, the creatives that have that have sort of yeah yeah given. Give, I don't the the, the the legacy narratives are as much theirs as they yes. are Harrison Ford's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And it's in, it's the, the, you you know you said at the start, Sarah, that this is a film about Harrison Ford, and it's in it and it absolutely, and it's a film about kind of in some way the Last Jedi was a bit like this about kind of thinking about one's relationship to. To yes. nostalgia to the past, yeah. to time. Yeah, and I think that that's why I haven't. I quite like it. Yes, you know, and, and certainly those moments. I was like I said earlier. I was very happy to be in the presence of Harrison Ford as I remember him. Kind of those moments. So it becomes about me mm. and the audience that is happy to kind of make that leap. I think as well, and, and not all are. Certainly. So, so what did you make of the the kind of final act then? Because that's probably where I. But oh right, you haven't gone where I I, I mm. was con I convinced myself we were going back to rage. We were going to do like iconic. We're yeah. going to go, we're going to do a Back to the Future. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, uh, he's you know, looking at himself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the roll the roll the roller goes that way this time. Uh, I don't know something naff like that. And so I'm pleased they didn't do that. Yeah. I wasn't expecting them to suddenly end up in Troy though. Yeah. Uh, you know both the film and the, the mythology, right? So that sequence we can talk about that. We've talked on the podcast before about kind of you know armies and yeah. the spectacle of armies feeling like a very not that felt very post you that felt very mm. post law of post gladiator yeah this did that, that there was something about the spectacle of that, <laughs> that's that what they yeah. post noughties in a way that the yeah. other bits did not so that's what they've gone back to they've not gone back to what is it 218 ad or 219 they've yeah. gone to they've gone 2004 with, yeah. Yeah. Pitt somewhere yeah, yeah, yeah they've gone back to 2004 uh, yeah. masses and multitudes I, mean, I guess at, at one level it is to situate indiana jones in a, as a mythical so you know yes, that, like that it belongs there, yeah. that it is part the of it. Oh, I'm kind of, oh, yeah. bored. Okay, right. Yeah, 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 that, yeah. That, that he belongs, uh, and at uh, the point where he kind of has the, the conversation, um, I want to stay here. This yeah, is that's where I belong. Odd, yeah. And at some point, you do think, I think he's going to do it. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and of course, you know, in terms of the characterization, he was going to do it. He has to be literally kind of dragged sure. out of that space. And the sense of that, 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 I guess, that it is a character of the past now. Yes. That this is the end. Um, he will. He has no future. He only exists as the past, but he exists as a, as the mythical kind of structures and artifacts that that the entire series has been investigating uh -huh. and trying to kind of claim. 
uh, claim for a museum all the time, kind of uh, that, that kind of sense of it, to, to preserve, I guess. He, he disappears into his own sense of history. Yeah. yeah okay. So I, I understand it as a statement, I think, from that respect. What, what is the statement then? Because the fact that he doesn't... You, I get, you know, it's okay. So Isn't allowed to? Let's do some clunky metaphors. Yeah. Harrison Ford is Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones is a character desperate to stay in the past where he feels he belongs and Phoebe Waller-Bridge rips him out of it against yeah. his will and puts him back in the present day. There's a certain kind of are we are we are we the are we the audience Phoebe Waller-Bridge in this scenario? It's like you know, just let me be in the past. Why are you dragging me back out? Um, and the fact that the film celebrates that he yeah. doesn't Do isn't that. left behind forever, and he's given a kind of more qu- quiet but more contemporary um, yeah. ending. I don't know what it's trying to you know for a film that. You know, it's that classic paradox. It's a film that seems to be saying, careful about jumping and losing yeah. yourself in but the Look past. at the de-aging. But look at all this. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels like the old movie. But it's that spectacle it? and celebration. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think fundamentally it wants to be a celebratory film yeah. mm. as its final statement and to not kind of have a heroic, a tra- tragically heroic sure. death. Sure. Um, for, and do you know what? I, I will go with that yeah. kind of happily. I don't want Indiana Jones, Ford, mm. lost in time. Um, in that way, I think you know there is a there is a kind of uh, a, I think an emphatic kind of um, enjoyment in saying Marion's back, kind of yeah, you know yeah. that kind of thing. It, it, it's trite. I mean, I'm, you know, and it's a small scale. You know, going back to why do we always end up with kind of romantic relationships as the, the kind of the be all and end all of success, kind of through that. So it's it's repeating mm-hmm. all of those tropes. But I think yeah, it, I think it wants to set up the idea of, of kind of the the, the character, of the world the performer as these kind of mythical mythic statuses um but but to not be tragic in its final statement Mm. i think again to still give ford and therefore jones a moment of of power and control and kind of Mm. um success Mm. yeah no i i i I agree i I, as somebody who's not that as i said not that familiar with the franchise i really enjoyed the film and i thought it was and i hate this phrase but it was a fitting end because i Mm. thought oh it's it's it seems to be doing it's using the aging not once but twice Mm. and we talked about this as well like this kind of second sequence where they're sort of playing a little bit with time um yes the film is about time the narrative is about time but it's also this kind of interesting reflection on aging stardom and aging bodies and people who are stars and people who have to give up their stardom i don't know there was something and i and i mm-hmm. agree i like the, the the idea that that you said that he sort of belongs he's a, he's a, he's a kind of mythical artifact you've now we've now put him in a box and you can wheel him and stick him next to the ark of the covenant and we we move on so he's yeah <laughs> but i think that's it isn't it it yeah. would be that kind of ending if he was left in the in the, yeah. the, the, the ancient past sure. you know the the ending of raiders of the lost ark is is where he, where we see that vast because sure. i kind of slightly disagree that we don't see scope and scale in these films, That's yeah. you know, we, we do, you know, we see kind of, you know, rallies in Berlin in Last yeah. Crusade. Um, we see the scope of that, that, that warehouse where the Ark mm. of the Covenant is. I mean, that's always a very disquieting ending yeah. for it. So is it a, is this a film about, yes, it's about time and so forth, but is, is it also about like the curation of, of the past mm. and the kind of historiographical, this is how we tell, this is how stories are told and this is where, this is how the past can work. And in how, relation how to the we present, we re- re- visualize the past in terms of the de-aging technique, right? Yeah, yeah. and we can recover. We can recover the past. Yes, and I think that's it. We recover yeah. Harrison Ford's face, basically, yeah. kind yeah. of, don't yeah. we? Yeah. And because the, the, there's a, another metaphor that kind of runs through it, where he's given the, the kind of the cheap brass clock for his retirement gift, mm. given that the Antikythera mechanism resembles a clock and kind of works on yeah. that kind of mechanism, a wrong clock and a right clock, basically, <laughs> as, as artefacts. Yeah. One that, that kind of that's mythical th- and allows Yeah, because that's how the film opens, that sound of sound of ticking, yeah. the ticking clock, and then you hear his definitely not de-aged voice, yes. and then you see his de-aged face. Yes, no, I, I did like it. Yeah, I did, I, did li- I did like it. I think the film, yeah, has its... Mm-hmm. But it's and unlikely. I think as well, it's Im- important to kind of think about, you know, across the kind of whole franchise, is that... On the whole, we experience these films fragmentedly. I don't know about you, but you, I tend to watch them on TV when they're on. Yeah. Bits of it, my one scene might catch you. Obviously yeah, not. I watched it two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I watched it over two nights on an yeah. iPad from Disney Plus. Yeah, Thank you very much. Yeah, kind of that. So just the Spielberg you intended. You know, these these have always been quite fragmented yeah. films, and they show them out of order. So we always kind of are negotiating that past and present, and what Ford looks like or the others look like at any particular. Yeah, which moment. one is this now? Yeah, yeah. yeah interesting. Where does he belong here? Yeah, what, cr- what was uh, kind of going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is that franchises generally then as well? Like this, this, 
this this kind of time. A lot of t de aging work mm. is in it are in franchise movies, um, yeah. the X Men movies, the Marvel movies, famously. But that, the, the, these kinds of I don't know franchises seem a, a welcome home for these kinds of terminators where time travel narratives yeah. and it seems like yeah franchises because you don't often if you're me certainly you don't watch them in the right order mm -hmm. they're already playing with our conceptions of time and so forth so actually this is just almost a film about i guess about so many things but it's, it's about like how how people have probably engaged with this yeah. franchise a bit then yeah, a, bit a bit recently there. a bit yeah. yeah and if you caught the opening sequence at the wrong time you know switching yeah. it on okay but not at all moments, but there would be a moment when, where you would think, and yeah. I think this is what it wants us to do, definitely. Am I, which one am I watching? I can't yeah, quite which, figure yeah, it yeah, out. Yeah. It, it um, there's a paradox, a temporal paradox in, in all of these kind of IP franchises, right? Which is that the, the, the story has to continually move as fast forward as possible mm -hmm. while staying still, right? Nothing can happen because we want a franchise to be at the end of this, so we can't really, you know, we can't kill off characters, yeah. can't do, we've got to keep all our options open and we want to create a situation where we can just do another one of these afterwards, mm -hmm. but we've got to make it as exciting as possible and do as many things in it whilst we do nothing. Yeah. So uh, there's a kind of, I don't mean this a kind of as a criticism, I'm saying there's a, there's a weird temporal paradox of, you know, mm -hmm. Bond movies have been doing the same thing again and again and again since 1962. Uh, and then once we do something different and everyone loses their mind, uh, you know, same is true here, same is true of Marvel. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Time is a problem. Yeah. Um, yes, well, time is a problem on that note. <laughs> <laughs> that was, um, that was uh, beautifully uh, done. Uh, I have one final note, um, which is the very opening uh, scene of the movie looks very like the Disney stunt show of Indiana Jones in Ho Hollywood Studios mm. in um, in Orlando. I don't actually know if it's still there or not. I've seen and I that. don't know if that is a deliberate thing or not. It, that always looked a bit like Raiders yeah. and a bit like yeah. Last Crusade and a bit like. But I think that's like well, that. you know, they, they, oh, right. they these they, they do kind of converge into kind of one, um, and it becomes quite difficult to kind of pick pick them apart thing around it. But on on another final note, just in terms of the very opening of it, it's yeah. the one bit that I do think. Is a shame as as a fan. Can I say thought. the Paramount thing? The Paramount yeah. logo, where it doesn't fade into a version of that Paramount logo. Uh, the molehill. I, I the, feel is, yeah. is really is a loss uh, of a marker yeah. of something. That and sounds like the gun barrel. The, the version. Yeah, it's yeah, that okay, kind fine. of thing. Yeah, yeah. and, and I, really I you know, it's, yeah. to, to see the Disney castle is fine, but yeah. but uh, the, there yeah, is a kind of sense, yeah. of, and I think that that kind of shows how long this film has been kind of going on. That when when you design kind of stuff like that in the past. The idea of having to kind of plan for who might own yeah. the IP at any point, and and if you build in a kind of a joke basically like that, a reference like that, how how long, how sustainable is it mm. yeah. through this? But yeah, it, it that is That's something that that does still I kind of I feel the loss of that I think. Yeah, they probably would have probably been tempted to do it right, but then yeah. they probably you know popped it at the end or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I see. Any and final notes from you? Chris? No, I, I I think the voice. Yeah, I, I mean I did have a thing about the voice in terms of yeah. It, it, the aging we've spoken a lot about the images but i think the sat the, the, yeah. the soundscape so yeah williams is, is score um and the the gruff voice of harrison ford i thought was kind of quite interesting i don't really have anything other than that um and i thought the train tunnel sequence was identical to skyfall and uh, mission impossible dead reckoning um <laughs> to the, have, how many bond references have we put let's let's you know, uh, but no I, I, th th there's a of course he's running on the top of the train of course there's going to be a tunnel of course they're going to have to um but it's interesting you know because of the mission impossible film and that's that film's rejection of digital well that film's rejection of explicit digital de-aging i would mm. say versus okay some stuff that's definitely gone on. So I guess what I like about the film is is how it seems to encapsulate a lot of what the... the uh, it encapsulates a lot about what is quite complex about the stars' overlap with technology in yeah. 2023, yeah. 2024, I would say. I mean, just again on that sequence, I think it's indicative of some of the other stuff we talked about around mm -hmm. characterization is even that train sequence, because of the way it's, it's filmed and, and composited together, there's still nothing ever at stake on that. Because you never really believe that they're on a train, yeah, and that they might fall off or something like that, because it's so kind of stable. If it wasn't within a de-age sequence, would you f would it feel different? Because you already you already know it's no, I artificial. think they just they just stand wrong. Oh, I think they kind of for it. I, it, it uh, to me, it totally that yeah. is much more uncanny and, and de-immersing yeah. than Harrison Ford's face and voice uh, for yeah. me at that moment. That's where I really kind of go. 
I've had, I've had enough of this, yeah. this bit. But I think maybe that's one of the things about the film is it, it's so invested in its own mythology, it, it, it forgets really to kind of say, really, there What's are there now? are minor things yeah. at stake here that really matter, and yeah. that's what really we invest in in a kind of story yeah. world. Interesting. Cool. Interesting. Right, great. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for talking through um, Indie Five with us. Um, you have um, a book coming out, or is it out already? The we're we're collection? working on an edited collection at the moment on stars and franchises. Okay. Um, Any thoughts on Harrison Ford appearing in that? Or, uh, he uh, won't appear in that because yeah. he's he's in the in the, the Indiana Jones um, yes. collection, which is where I talk much more about the, the history and legacy yeah. of, of, of Ford in, in Indiana Jones, and I think that's coming out. Uh, I think next year with the, Manchester University. The, the Stardom is coming out next year, or the Indiana. Jones? The Indiana Jones collection. Is the Stardom book Manchester will University. be Stardom and franchises will probably be twenty twenty six. Well. Okay. Listeners in 2026, <laughs> go out and buy it now. We've, what a temporarily uh, uh, confusing podcast this has been. But yeah, <laughs> but, but yeah absolutely. Okay, well, terrific. Um, well, I look forward to both those publications coming out um, and seeing your thoughts um, formalised in print. Great. Um, and thanks so much for coming on the show. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's been brilliant. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no, right. Uh, so, have we got any Indiana Jones stuff online? No, we no haven't. So, so I'm now thinking about right, Donna Destiny. Fancy-animation.org. Click on the Contact Us tab. Chris would love to hear your suggestions for uh, blog Always. posts in the future. Um, you can listen to the archive of podcasts wherever you get your podcasts, but you can also find it on fancy-animation.org. Uh, we're at Fan Anim Research on various social media outputs. Uh, and that's been us for another week. Bye. Bye.